really excited about our speaker tonight. So Josh Wexler, the founder and CEO of Akamon Group, I actually met him a month ago um, when I attended this workshop that he did. And I was like, this is awesome. So now you need to come to Boston and do this at Harvard. And amazingly, he said yes. So really excited to have him here tonight. This is going to be fun. It's going to be interactive. You can see there's like stuff in the middle of your table. So be prepared to work and enjoy. Thanks, Abby. Um, I think, is this on? Can people hear me okay? All right, great. So just before I jump into who I am and what we're going to do tonight, I'd like to just see who's in the room. So raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, that's like 90% of you. Um, so raise your hand if you're not a student. Okay. Um, so raise your hand if you're a designer. Okay, raise your hand if you're a developer, write code. Okay, cool. Raise your hand if you're kind of a business person, you're interested in doing entrepreneurship or, you know, okay. Now raise your hand if you feel like you have an idea that you want to pursue, right? Okay, it's a lot of you. Raise your hand if you don't have an idea, but what's your name again? Steven. Steven, you're like, Steven, you have skills, but you're not sure what idea you want to pursue quite yet. Okay. Um, those of you who have ideas, I hope you just watched who raised their hands because they could be good people to recruit. Um, all right, so my name is Josh Wexler, as Abby so beautifully said. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of the Occam Group. What we do is we do this for a living. Uh, we work with Fortune 500 companies all the way down to individual entrepreneurs on helping them to understand what it is that they actually want to build, helping them to communicate that to each other, then helping them understand whether that's going to be a good thing to invest in or not, a good idea to invest in or not, and then we help them build it as well, right? So we really work with, for example, MTV, um, KPMG, Deloitte, you know, I don't know, I just... Some of our clients are at that level, all the way down to people like some of the composers for some of the television shows that are on TV right now, right? So what we found is we've developed this framework, what we're calling the ideation framework, that we've taken every single one of those clients I just mentioned through. And it really doesn't seem to matter whether they are you know, huge or small individuals. They all seem to need to go through the same process. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about two really big questions, talk about the framework itself. I want to actually have you experience the framework. So you're actually going to be going through the, the, all the different exercises and processes that we take our clients through. And you're going to do it all on index cards and paper. And then we're going to talk about a couple of takeaways. So if you have any questions while I'm going through this, please feel free to raise your hand. But we will have, uh, it's not going to make it necessarily on the video. So if possible, we're going to try to save questions till the end uh, for a, for a Q&A. All right, so the two big questions that we work on in the Aachen Group. The first one is, how do you communicate a technical idea to other people, right? Or how do you communicate any idea to other people, right? You know, I have this great idea for a website that's really a social network for dogs, right? Okay, what? You know, what, what are you talking about, right? What, what does that even mean, right? And even if you get into really describing what that means, it can be incredibly hard to still have that same shared vision, right? And that's for a couple of reasons. Communication is difficult. Even if you try to write this idea down, you could write millions and millions of pages of documentation on this idea, right? This Facebook for dogs is going to have dogs on it. And it's going to have pictures of dogs. And, and, and it still doesn't really capture the idea, right? The other problem is you can be trying to explain it to people. You can be using you know, words and trying to talk to someone. Yet you can be saying the same thing and thinking, slightly to incredibly different things, right? A second question that we talk about and work on all the time is how do you decide which ideas will be valuable, right? What ideas are going to be where business, customers, and technology, in our case, interact? Now, I want to take a second just to explain that what we're going to do today is going to be based around technology as a concept. But it can be applied to almost anything that you do. And I'll make sure to try to hit on some of the other points about physical products or even services that can go through this process and I think get a lot of value out of it. But for us, we're focused in technology, so we've developed this mostly out of the technology world. 
So we talk about all the time, and what we're always asking is, what's going to, what idea is going to be able to capture the business, the customers, and be with the technology? To put it another way, and I can't take credit for this, this was a fantastic book by a guy, uh, Marty Kagan, wrote Inspired, which is a fantastic book on product management, which if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it is, he talks about developing products that are at the intersection between valuable, usable, and feasible, which I love because I think that you have to have all three in order for a product to really be successful. So to find out what is going to intersect, right, you have to collect some feedback. But collecting meaningful feedback is very, very difficult, right? I can't tell you how many times we've put things in front of people, and especially as we were sort of learning and experimenting with this process and how to do it, we would put in front of people some really beautiful stuff, right? Stuff that was really, we thought was really well designed and really cool, right? And all the feedback we got was, oh, that's, that's, that's gorgeous, right? It's like, no, 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 but, but would you actually use this Facebook for dogs? Like, no, but the dogs are so cute. It's like, no, 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 those are just placeholder images. They're like, yeah, no, I know, but it, they're still really cute. It's like, well, OK, is that really meaningful? Or are you just responding to the cuteness of the dogs? Obviously, the latter. So with any new idea, people don't know what they want until they've seen it, they've tried it, and most importantly, they've experienced it. So how do we manufacture or build these experiences that can actually get us to that meaningful feedback faster, right? And in the process of doing that, how do we create a situation where we can learn as much as possible, both about our product, but also about what is going to be at that intersection, right? Usable, valuable, and feasible, or with customers, match a business model, and have the technology. So one of our favorite uh, quotes, a Chinese proverb, which I still haven't attributed to anybody, um, although I think I figured out that it is Confucius. Uh, Tell me something, and I will forget. Show me something and I can remember, involve me and I will understand, which I think is really cool. And so just the final point on this is what, what we're trying to do here and what we're going to do with this framework is give you a way to quickly and most effectively communicate via sort of building a common language your idea to others so that you can, instead of being saying the same thing but thinking different things, get as close to as possible of saying the same thing and meaning the same thing. So the framework is a three-step process that we take our clients through. And again, this doesn't have to be for technology. I want to re-emphasize that. So the first phase, and what we're actually going to take you all through tonight, is the envisioning phase. And for us, the envisioning phase, we'll get into this later, but it's basically getting all the background information and getting it expressed in a very clear and succinct way, right? This really gets everyone on the same page around the context of the idea. The next piece is once you've settled on a solution and you've done a lot of the background work and assumption gathering, then you go into prototype, okay? So the prototype for us is a, you know, what and we'll get into this later, a medium fidelity technical prototype, right? If it's an iPhone app that we're prototyping, it'll work on the iPhone and look and feel like the real thing possibly. For a physical product, you can find lots and lots of different ways to prototype physical products. The idea is to create that experience, a physical experience, if it is a physical product, the kind of visual touch feel experience, if it's a mobile product, et cetera, with the prototype. Then you go into evaluation. So for us, we actually take these prototypes and put them in front of potential users and clients. What is amazing about it is the amount of feedback you get really, really quickly are able to see wow, like this assumption was right on, this assumption is questionable, this assumption is dead off, we really need to rethink this piece of it, and we, you know, this piece was fantastic, or sometimes it's we should just scrap this whole idea, other times it's, okay, this is great, we really gotta move forward with this. Now in the talk, I'm not really gonna cover evaluation, you know, a lot of people are curious about that, um, maybe uh, Abby and I can do a talk one day about how to evaluate an idea. But let's start out with the envisioning stage. So these are the different steps that we go through every single time. It does not matter what kind of client we're working with, what size, who those people are. It's amazing. Because every single time that we start with a client and they say, oh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I've already thought through that. And when we start talking to them about their product and their ideas, we're like, wait a second. What problem are you trying to solve again? They're like, oh, well, it's sort of like this. And inevitably, someone else on the team is like, what? 
No, it's not. We were solving this problem. I thought we talked about this. And we're like, OK, whoops. <laughs> we should have gone back and started here. So we always start with our problem statement, right? What problem are we trying to solve? We move into inspiration, then expressing the idea. And we'll go through these in depth. And you'll have a chance to actually do these in a moment. Customer definition. Personas, right? Who are the people that are actually going to be using your product and trying to get at some of your own assumptions about those people? User narratives, what stories can you tell about these people using your product? And finally, paper prototyping. So, in order to explain and show you how this is going to work and kind of give you some illustrative examples, we're going to use one of my friends who's actually a Harvard graduate, Rafi Rosenblatt. There he is. I know, he's adorable, so fun, so cute. Um, and Rafi is an amazing guy. He has been working, he, can't, he graduated out of the Kennedy School here, um, got a job at uh, Teach for America, did a lot of work there. And then he started working at a great uh, nonprofit called Year Up, and uh, actually based in Boston, and has been, had been working there, I believe, a couple of years. And Rafi came to me with this statement, and I hear this a lot. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if students could improve their study habits with a mobile app, right? This was his idea. He really thought that if students had a way of improving their study habits with a mobile app, it could be incredibly successful. So I sat down with Rafi and I said, OK, Rafi, you have no technical skills. You've never built an app before in your life. You don't know anything about product or product management. Awesome. Let's get started. So the very first thing I had him do was write down his problem statement. So we define a problem statement very specifically. It's one to two sentences that describe an issue or need for a target customer that you're going to solve. Okay? Notice how I said one to two sentences. Whenever I talk to people and I'm like, oh, so what problem are you trying to solve? They launch into this very long, drawn out, well, it's sort of like this, and you know, there's all these other issues that are at play here. That's awesome, and I totally agree that every problem has an enormous amount of you know, other implications and shades of gray and all that stuff. But this is about getting your idea and problem out there in a succinct way that you can communicate to others. If you start going off on a number of different details, it can be incredibly hard for me to understand the core of what you're talking about. So here's Rafi's problem statement, which I think is fantastic. Too many students never complete high school, not because they lack intelligence, but because they never gained the academic habits they needed. What I love about this problem statement is two things. One, he talks about who these people are, right? Obviously, it's students. And it's students who are not completing high school. Okay, So he's identified a really interesting population. And then he's, you know, um, hinted at some of the causal pieces. Now, he happens to be a domain expert, so I think he's probably right. But of course, this is a hypothesis of not because they lack intelligence, but because they never gained the academic habits they needed, which starts to imply a solution, but is still a really nice problem statement because it's broad enough that maybe a mobile app isn't going to actually solve this at all. There's nothing that says mobile app in this to me necessarily, right? So, guess what? You guys get to do it. Woohoo! Who's excited? Oh, yeah, there we go. One person, two people. <laughs> I knew Abby, she's always excited to do some exercises. All right, so here's what we're going to do. You've been approached, uh, you've got this idea, whatever, however it's come to you, I don't know. But the idea statement is a mobile app that helps people book flights faster. Okay, so this is the idea you're going to be working on for the rest of the time. Okay, a mobile app that helps people book flights faster. So what I'd like for you to do is take each, everybody take a couple of index cards. You're going to need like maybe five or six each. Grab them. They're in the center of your table. Make some friends. Maybe you awkwardly grab it at the same time and your hands touch. And it starts a beautiful romance. I don't know. Um, at certain tables, that may be awkward. I don't know. Um, all right. Everyone got some index cards? This should be fun, guys. And if it's not, then I'm, a, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do this. These exercises, are, it, basically, the structure is always going to be the same. You're going to do something. You're going to write something down on each index card, each individual index card. Then you're going to share to the person next to you. And the reason we're doing this kind of in a solitary way is that 
this, is, this can be done with your, your own ideas, and we do this with our own ideas all the time in the Aachen Group. I mean, we constantly have ideas for products. We force ourselves always, OK, well, we actually call it an idea brief, which is all of this stuff put together in a bunch of index cards or on a piece of paper or whatever. You're not allowed to bring up your idea at the Aachen Group unless you've actually done all that first. Okay? And so the reason why I'm asking you to do this on your own rather than in teams is for that very reason. I want you to be able to do this for your own ideas. right? And then I also want to be clear that we do this mostly with teams. Okay? So this process can absolutely be used with teams as well. All right, so take your first index card, and I want you to take a minute to write down your problem statement. Okay? So the problem statement is for this idea. Okay, I don't want a general problem statement about like, you know, I don't know, I feel bad today or whatever. It should be the problem statement for a mobile app that helps people book flights faster. Does that make sense? Okay, no confusion, not a general problem statement. It's about whatever you think the problem statement could be for a problem that helps people book flights faster. So take a minute and write that down. And I'm going to time you guys, and then I'm going to tell you when you have no more time left and you have to put your pens down and everyone frantically scribbles as much as possible. All right. So now you have a minute, but turn to someone next to you and share your problem statement for 30 seconds, then have the other person share their problem statement. Yeah, right. And make sure to introduce yourself before you jump into this. It's kind of awkward when you start sharing problems with people and you don't know their name yet, or at least I find that's the case. So I, uh, I realize that um, it's going to be hard for me to get everyone's attention again. So what we're going to do is something I learned at uh, Agile with Abby. I'm just going to hold my hand up. And if you see me holding my hand up, other people just hold your hand up and stop talking. Obviously, that's the second half of that. And if you don't stop talking, then you're just mean. OK. So. I would love to hear real quick if someone in the room, or maybe one or two people, can you share your problem statement with the rest of the group? Oh, there we go. Wow, that's fast. Yeah. It's difficult to find the cheapest flight across different locations. Great. Hold on one sec. <laughs> Going to make Abby run all over the place. People perceive booking flights take forever on all platforms, and hence they do not become loyal customers of any one booking service. Great. Like that a lot. That's nice. Yep. Oh, we got a second one here. Actually, you know what? I can probably just man the front of the room. And uh, potential customers are not booking flights because the booking process takes too long, and a faster system would increase the number of customers. Great. I really like that. That sort of rephrases a lot of the idea pieces and puts it into more of a testable hypothesis, which is actually really, really, really helpful for people in order to understand kind of, well, what is it that you're actually trying to solve? All right, so we're going to move on because I want to get us through the entire process tonight. Um, inspiration. So inspiration is defined as other systems that attempt to solve our problem or inspire us with their design or functionality. So I realized yesterday I was doing this for a class um, at, at Harvard, and, and I, was, I realized that part of the reason why we created this step is because when people have ideas, they fall in love with their ideas, right? It's like inevitable, right? It's, it's idea love, right? I used to call them idea babies. It's like you had this baby and you don't want to give it up. <clears throat> and if anyone tells you that it's ugly, that you want to slap them because, you know, don't call my child ugly, you jerk, right? Yet, they shouldn't be precious at all, right? They're still just ideas. They're worthless. You haven't done that much with it, right? So for us, this inspiration piece is actually can be quite a bit of sort of psychological uh, difficulty to it. In other words, what we're asking you to do here, what we ask all of our clients to do, is to go out into the world and go look for other things that do what you think you want to do, right? Or what else solves that problem? And the reason we do this is for a number of things. But the two biggest ones are, first of all, they've, if they've done it, that's awesome. What did they do right? What did they do well? And how can you differentiate yourself from them, right? It'd be a lot better to know who those people are and really understand them rather, you know, now rather than after you've invested a lot of money and realized, oh, I can never beat these guys anyway. But the second one is, if nobody's doing your idea, you may be in a lot of trouble, right? Nobody doing your idea is like, 
a real red flag because if you're out there trying to sell this thing that no one's literally ever heard of or thought of, which let's face it, that's probably not going to be the case. But you know, if it's something that's really uncommon, then you basically have what's called the educational sale, right? You basically have to educate your customers to the point of making them want to use it, and that is incredibly hard to do. And while I'm sure there are some good salesmen in the room, I don't know anyone who can do that effectively. So, if you can. I'd love to meet you. All right, so inspiration, again, is defined as other systems that attempt to solve our problem or inspire us with their design or functionality. And so what we have our uh, clients do, and Rafi in particular, we have them pull together an inspiration board. Um, we use a particular tool that we love, and I, I always like showing it off because I think it's fantastic, called Murally. Uh, it is spelled M-U-R-A-L dot L-Y. Um, and we'll post the slides and the links after the, the talk. But I wanted to show you guys the, the inspiration board capabilities. It's basically like a, an online whiteboard that allows you and your team to collaborate about stuff. What I think is just so cool is you, know, you can zoom in and out, and you can basically post things to it, like, for example, these links. You know, and they'll pop up, and it's just a really nice way to contextually keep things together. What, uh, what you're actually seeing here, again, just to show that you know, the Aachen Group actually does what we say we do, uh, this is our inspiration board for an internal product we've decided to start developing. Um, so we are right in the midst of actually putting stuff on this board. So we had Rafi do this. And again, you guys will do this yourselves. But what you'll see here is you can kind of see there's, there's Evernote, right, if you know of Evernote. There's a couple of other you know, grade-related um, apps that he found. And what's really interesting is there was a lot of things that were not you know, part of what he was really wanting to do. They had nothing to do with education. But they were still really interesting in terms of things he wanted to borrow. right? So inspiration by no means is just competitive analysis. right? That's also why we call it inspiration. Evernote for him is designed beautifully. He loves the aesthetic of it. That was really helpful for him. He also thinks that the fact that Evernote is so seamless in the way it syncs with everything was a huge thing to borrow from. So now it's going to be your turn. So again, back to our mobile app that helps people book flights faster. Now you have your problem statement. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to put your problem statement kind of above your stack of index cards, OK? So oh, that's nice. Look at that, this little problem statement uh, stand for you. It's beautiful. These tables were designed for this workshop. I don't know if you guys knew that, uh, but they were. So uh, stand your problem statement up. and. Um, now we're going to do a little bit of inspiration. So actually, let me ask, first of all, who here has booked a flight online? As opposed to calling in? Exactly. OK. <laughs> it's supposed to be a trick question, but I feel like if there's like one person that's like, I only use old school travel agents or something, then I'd ask that you like help that person out maybe in relating to them what you know, is involved in this. Because if, if you've never done this before, this could actually be a difficult exercise. Um, all right. So take two minutes now to come up with a piece of inspiration. So maybe this is kayak.com, right? Uh, kayak.com is a mobile site that helps you, you know, kind of book flights faster. It helps you to compare prices, right? So name kayak.com. What do I like? I like that I can compare prices across whatever, whatever, and I feel like it's really easy to use. What do I not like? I hate the orange color. These are terrible examples, but you know, whatever. And what can you borrow? I would love to be able to borrow that price comparison chart that they have. That makes sense? So you're going to now take an index card for each piece of inspiration, come up with more than one if you have time, and write down the name, what you like, what you do not like, and what you can borrow. Again, for this mobile app that can help people book flights faster. So you'll have two minutes starting now. All right. Now, as you should be getting used to, please turn to someone else and you have a minute and take 30 seconds each to share the inspiration that you've come up with. All right, guys. Hands up. Well, there we go. That's so crazy how well that works. Uh, I actually shown that at Agile, and it just, I was like, oh, come on, that's stupid. And then I did it, and it was like, oh, whoa, that's so fast. 
A um, little slower with you guys, not going to lie, but I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so if someone would like to share their one piece of inspiration they found and kind of walk us through what they, they put. You? Yeah? Uh, me? Yeah, sure. Awesome. So I picked through Google. If you actually like search like flights to Dallas, it'll actually spit out a bunch of flights. And basically the reason I picked that, it like basically saves a stack. Like you don't have to do kayak.com. So basically for the convenience. Nice. What it, so what did you like about it? Uh, so basically what I liked about it was the convenience. Um, kind of what I don't like about it, not as much functionality. For example, it's not an app, so you have to do it from your computer. Mm -hmm. And then kind of what you can borrow, um, maybe some sort of convenience factor. Cool. So. Great. All right, awesome. All right, guys. So we're going we're gonna to move on. So typically, what, what just to kind of wrap up on the inspiration piece, what we'll do with this is we'll take all of these different pieces of inspiration, pull them into Murally for us, uh, take screenshots of them. And what will also be really helpful about that is we can start to borrow a lot of the design elements. So that's really important for us in the, in the sort of technology space. You know, there's, they've invested a lot of these applications that we look at, have invested a lot of time and money into their UX, their UI, right, their user interfaces, their graphics. We can borrow a lot of that stuff, especially for our earlier stage products. So I think that's just a, a tip that I learned sort of the hard way. So the next step that we would do here is starting to build your idea deck. Uh, the next step would be an idea expression. An idea expression is a short, succinct st statement of your idea that everyone agrees to, right? So in our case, it's going to be a mobile app that helps people book flights faster, right? And the reason I've given you this is typically people don't start with a problem. Nine times out of ten when I work with people, they don't, it's not really about solving a problem for them. It's actually an idea that they had, right? So I just wanted to be, I just wanted to show you guys that this process should always start with the problem statement, even if you have that idea to start. So customer definition. For us, actually, did I miss a slide? No. Okay. So customer definition. Now, who is actually going to be using right, this, this app, right? This, this mobile app that helps people book flights faster? And starting with everyone is not a very good demographic, right? <laughs> Who here has tried to design something for everyone? Right. I don't know about your experience, but mine was it didn't work for anybody. Right? It just was kind of crappy for every single individual I ever talked to. So what we've realized is even to start, right? and again, a lot of what you're writing here are hypotheses. Who do you think would be the first person to use your system? Right? Who are going to be these early adopters? Who are the people that feel the pain of your problem the most? Right? So. Um, Steven, I'm just going to pick on you. What was your problem statement? Uh, my problem statement was actually quite focused. So when people need to catch a flight immediately, such as when a family member is kind of struck by illness okay. or when they have an urgent business meeting, they don't have time to go through all the state of mind to go through like some sort of complex process. Great. I'm sorry I picked on you because that was way too long. But uh, not, not too long generally speaking, but for my example, it, it's going to be hard. But for, so there you go. You've already, you've actually implied like three different customer demographics in that, right? Which is great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You want to start to narrow things down in order to understand, OK, here's the general people that are going to be feeling my pain the most. People who have just lost a family member? Wow, yeah, that's deep. Um, but this app would really save their lives, right? So that's good. Um, all right, so Ravi's customer definition were students in 6th to 12th grade who own smartphones. What I love about his problem definition, uh, his customer definition is, first of all, it's not everybody in, on the planet. It's not everyone who has a mom, right, because that's cheating. Um, it's students in 6th to 12th grade, and that even that was actually narrowed down quite a bit, only to high school students by the end. Uh, who own smartphones. What I also like about this is there's a kind of yes or no answer to this demographic. You have to own a smartphone in order to use an app, right? I believe it or not have had clients who have hired us to create social network learning platform for them where literally the, the, the people who are going to be using the platform did not have a computer access. So uh, I recommended that they hired a, hire a wizard to help them. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know any, but if you guys do, let me know. Uh, all right, so now it's going to be your turn for your customer definition. This shouldn't take too long. Please come up with at least two meaningful customer groups. Now, customer groups can be defined by age, defined by sort of a set of behavior, a life event, as Stephen has, has pointed out. 
um, jobs, whatever, but they have to be at least two of these meaningful groups, right? So maybe it's 20 to 30 year olds who are working in um, you know, professional services firms who need to book flights constantly. All right, so one minute, go. And make sure that you come up with two customer groups, or three, or four. You're only going to choose one, though. All right. Again, turn to someone next to you. It can be a different person if you'd like, and share for 30 seconds. Go. All right. So who would like to share one with a group? Can I pick on you? All right. We have Mike coming to you. One sec, one. There it is. Boom. All right, so uh, I chose, or I've got two groups. So the first one was uh, young travelers uh, who travel a lot. And I chose them because young people are more likely to use an app. Uh, and my second group was business travelers of all, uh, any age, because oftentimes business travelers aren't in front of their office or they don't have their laptop open. So they need to do something mobile, um, and they could use a mobile app. Great. Awesome. So now we're going to jump into personas. So again, all of these customer definitions, the ideas, problem statements, I want to reemphasize these are all hypotheses, right? You don't know whether these things are true or not, right? I don't know if young people actually care about using their smartphones. I don't know if business travelers are always on the go. They seem like fair assumptions to me, but those are things to be tested in the world. The, the persona is now a more in-depth look at one of your demographics, okay? Or maybe multiple demographics, depending. But for in our case, you're going to choose one. And a persona is a character created, right? You're making this up. These people should be based off maybe you know, your life experience, if, if you know these people. Or if not, fine. Characters created to represent the different user types within your targeted demographic, attitude, and or behavior set that might use your solution, right? So actually, your behavior set of always on the go that's a great persona. So maybe you'd choose a businessman and you'd really describe out, okay, here's who this person is in terms of the relevant details for what your idea is and or your problem statement is. And here's his goals, right? Here's what he really wants, okay? So let's go through Rafi's persona, which I think was pretty fantastic. So he took that demographic of 6th to 12th graders who own smartphones and he created Derek. Derek is obviously based off of a lot of his experience as a teacher in the New York City public schools as part of TFA. So Derek Rodriguez, he's 14 years old, he's a ninth grader in NYC. His background is he attends a large urban high school, owns a smartphone and loves to use it, does not own a computer, so uses his phone for, as his primary technology regularly does his homework, and I'm not going to read the rest, but as you can see, the background is very relevant to this idea, okay? So a lot of people will talk about personas as being somewhat useless if you start going into like, well, Derek was born in 1990, whatever it is that makes him 14, and, you know, and his mom was Latino, and she really loves the bakery down the street. I mean, okay, whatever, like, that's awesome detail, and if you need to go there in your own head to make this guy real, sweet. But it really doesn't matter for the, for the case of the persona and what you're designing for. So try to come up with some of the relevant background details. Next piece is the goals, right? These are critical. This is why Derek would use Rafi's app, OK? And th what I love about these is by expressing these, and when we actually did this with Rafi, we talked to a bunch of Derek's, quote unquote, in the world, and we asked them, or had them tell us, what are their goals, right? And do they actually match up with these? And Derek's goals are he wants to keep track of his homework assignments on his phone, and he wants to do well in class and get good grades. Makes sense? And for Derek, he's got a couple of frustrations. Frustrations are things that would drive him to use the app, right, or drive him to use the product. Even though he studies, he still does not feel like he gets the grade he thinks he deserves, and he does not know how to get a better grade through studying. So now you're going to write your very own persona, right? So take two minutes and write one persona. Give them the following, a name, an age, the background, one, two to three points, relevant background again, and the goals, right? Why would they use their system? So what, what was your name? Uh, Adam. Adam's, you know, uh, Adam, what's your last name? Anna. 
Adam Hanna is a businessman who is in his 30s. Uh, his background is that he lives in an urban center and he travels every week, right? You guys kind of get the picture, hopefully. His goals are that as he's traveling, he would love to be able to whip open his phone and rebook his flights, right? Try not to use that exact example because I just obviously made that up and that sort of be cheating in a weird way. Um, but anyway, ready? Two minutes, go. So now... Again, please turn to someone else and share your persona for 30 seconds. All right, so I'm gonna ask Abby to share her, <laughs> share her persona. Okay, so um, for context, my, my problem statement was um, it's too much work to find a fun destination for and book a spontaneous getaway. So my um, persona is Christina, she's 28. She works full time at a startup and she's also taking some classes. Um, she doesn't ever get to find time to go out with her friends. Um, she also loves traveling, but also can never seem to find time to do that because she's always working. Um, so her goals are to get to go to some fun places and just get away from everything where she can just spend time with friends. Love it. That sounds so fun. I'd like to know her. <laughs> um, so that's fantastic. That's exactly what I was talking about, Abby. Lovely example. So just a couple of other pieces on personas. Typically, we will do actually two to three personas um, covering at least one demographic with anybody because typically you'll have different archetypes within that demographic, and the personas are a helpful way to get at that, right? So as you start writing out your persona and you're like, oh man, you know, what about this behavior? What about this attribute? Or what about this thing? And you really can't fit it into that persona, that's fine. Start a new persona, right? So we've been, we did a lot of work with a big magazine publisher a little while ago, helping them to kind of create a digital um, uh, property uh, blog, actually. And it was really fascinating because they understood their, their users so well. We had like 10 different personas. And actually, our challenge was to really to find where really the critical difference is in these personas. Again, you don't actually know yet, right? You haven't tested anything yet. But this is a great way to express who you think is actually going to use your product. Yeah. If it's not 10, is there a, a max that you uh, advise clients on? Yeah, three. Okay. Yeah. Uh? Oh, sure. So uh, the question was, do we advise on a max number of personas? And actually, it's always three. Uh, ten was crazy. They were actually like the most minute differences. And for us, this is about communication, not about getting everything exactly right up front. Right? It's about getting the ideas out there. So for us, it was like, wow, ten? You know, that seems a little crazy. And when we really questioned it, it was like, well, really? These behaviors seem subtly different. It was like, you know, one was an eye banking woman who has a fashion blog open all the time. And one was a professional services woman who has a fashion blog open all the time. I was like, trust me, I know a lot of people in both of those areas, and they're the same people. Like, they're really <laughs> the same people. Uh, I'm just kidding to all of you who inspire to go into eye banking and whatever. Um, all right, so let's jump into user narratives. And again, we'll, we'll do Q&A afterwards. I'd, I'd love to hear your guys' questions. Um, so a user narrative, this absolutely is the most important part of all of this. Uh, the prototype is great, but the prototype is based off of the stories you want to tell about your product. And if you're not telling good stories, you don't have a very good product, in my personal opinion. And another guy by the name of Jack Dorsey, who invented Twitter and Square, totally agrees with me, personally. This video, he's like, Josh Wexler is totally right about that. I'm just kidding. He doesn't actually say that. But what he does say is that these are really, really powerful. You should totally watch this video. I'll send out the link after the talk. So user narratives. A user narrative is a story about one of the personas using and interacting with the idea in the world, right? Narratives are different than features, but they can contain features, OK? We'll go through an example in a second, but what this really is is you telling a story about how your product actually affects that person, right? Abby, what was the name of your girl again? Christina. Christina, right? This is a story about how Christina uses Abby's amazing new app, right? Which she hasn't actually defined any features yet or UI or anything yet. This is the story of what happens to Christina, a you know, lonely girl who's so busy she doesn't have any time. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, but actually, you can think of user, user narratives as a kind of like a movie script, right? Uh, the more I've been working on this, the more I've begun to think of that, uh, them like a movie script. 
So Rafi's narrative. If you remember Derek, right, Derek's goal is to, let me see if I can, here you go, is to track his homework assignments on his phone, and he wants to get good grades in class. I will say, this is one of the places where we were still developing this. This was about two years ago that we did this with Rafi. And uh, so we actually do these a little differently now, but this was his user narrative. So imagine Derek, 14 years old, sitting in his ninth grade math class in New York City. So he's in his math class and he hears about a test in a week. He opens the app, adds the test, and can see all the study steps he will need to complete to do well on the test. He adds those steps to his plan. Now the problem with this story, although I really like it, it's actually just really the start of the story. What needs to also happen, and what I would have coached Rafi to do now, is to include, okay, then what happens, right? Then does he use that to actually complete the study steps, right? How does he actually meet his goal, okay? But let me explain to you how much more awesome this is than when someone tells me, hey, so the, the system's going to do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and you're not going to believe it, but it also does this, right? You're like, what? What are you talking about, right? This is like, oh, I could see Derek doing this, right? Even though I've never used this app before or seen it or anything, I can understand this story. And that's really what Jack Dorsey says, is the power of these stories is communication. So now you're going to write your very own user narrative. Take your Christina's, your personas, and give me an awesome story, which one of you is going to read aloud. And what happens when they use their mobile app? What's the background, right? What's, what's, uh, what's this person doing? And then how do, are, they gonna be, are their goals going to be met through using this application, okay? The background is literally like, you know, Christina's at a bar and has, on a whim, wants to go travel, right? So she opens the app. That's background, okay? All right, so two minutes, uh, starting at now. All right, please share your stories. How exciting. <laughs> um, hopefully the reason it was hard for everyone to stop talking is that this is where things actually get kind of interesting and kind of good, right? Up until now, if you sat me down and walked me through all of these steps, I'd be like, no, OK, cool. I guess you have some people you're thinking of. But it's really in the stories where the communication value starts to take hold, right? Now you can really sit down and tell someone else, right, anyone else about this product idea. And I have a really good rubric for when you get too in-depth in your user narratives. It's when the other person you're telling doesn't, I was about to say give a shit, but give a shit, <laughs> okay? When they're like, uh, uh, okay, I guess, whatever. You've gone too far in your user narratives. That's not what they're about, right? These are not about describing every single feature in detail. These are really the overall story of that user, OK? Cannot drive that home enough. Now we're going to actually get into some prototyping. So this is going to be specifically for a mobile application, but I want to really reemphasize again that these paper prototypes are hand-drawn versions of that user narrative. And that can be anything, right? If you're talking about a physical product, you can draw out both what that product looks like and how a person or an actor might actually use that product, okay? You can use the same technique for that. In this case, we're going to be doing some paper prototyping. And we're going to be doing it the sort of way we do it. Can you hand me a piece of paper, please? Sure. Why, thank you. Uh, okay, so here are your stencils. Everyone has pieces of paper. Please grab one uh, or two, whatever. Uh, I probably just have one, though. What we're going to do is take each of these little panels, and you're going to actually illustrate your story, right? It's kind of like being in grade school or even preschool, where it's like, OK, now draw your story, right? But we really do capture an enormous amount of other details and information when you start to actually draw out what it is you're doing. We'll talk about more on paper prototyping in a second. But what this does is it's really going to bring your story to life. So, uh, let's say your story is uh, Christina books a flight and whatever. So you know your first panel of the page might be Christina logging into the application. The second panel might be her on the home page. The, the third panel might be her when she's actually searched a flight, right? You're not trying to describe everything in between, all the features. You're literally just storyboarding visually, right, your story. Now, I also want to point out that everybody can draw. And I've really noticed a lot of people start to um, like literally write stuff in these boxes. Like they, they just start writing text. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about drawing. I'm literally saying like squares. Who here can draw a square? OK. 
Okay, everyone raises their hand, please, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, right. Everyone can draw a square and a triangle, right? Guess what? In software, that's all that exists. Squares and triangles in different shapes and sizes and colors. That's like it, okay? I mean, there's a little more to it than that, but basically. So draw squares, draw boxes. Show us what happens when your persona is actually doing your user narrative visually. So I'll show you what happens when Derek opens his his uh, app in math class adds his tests, can see all the study steps he needs to complete to do well on the tests, and adds those steps to his plan. The first thing you do is open his app. Here's Rafi's actual drawings, okay? He would come to his home page and he would add some stuff to do, right? And he can already see some of his other tasks. He would then go in to add an actual class, right? And he would put in his math class. He'd then fill out some information about that class. He would kind of go on and on. Now, Rafi had a lot more time than you guys to draw this stuff, so there's a lot more detail than you should be including. But I just want to show how much more real all of a sudden this app has become, right? This is literally walking through every single piece of his application for, for that story, of course. Okay? Then those study steps have been actually added to his list, right? Yay! So awesome. So now it's your turn. So I'm going to give you guys four minutes. I want you to, you know, if you screw something up, guess what? It's paper. You drew it. It's probably not a true work of art yet. Cross it out. Start again. Not a big deal, OK? So you've got four minutes to do it. And then you'll all be awesome prototypers. All right. So now take your prototype and turn to someone else. Now each of you has a minute and walk them through it, OK? All right, so I saw there was maybe a little bit of confusion around, all right, well, so what actually goes into these boxes? Should it be our actor using the thing, or should it actually be the user interface? Now, I, what I love about that is it actually can be either one. Both are actually valuable. And the whole point of this exercise, and hopefully what you began to see, even as you had to explain it to someone else, is that you may have gone a little too deep on some places. You may have gone a little too broad, right? Stick figures walking around. You're pointing at him. Did he do? Did he mess up? No, you're just talking. OK. Um, that, that looked really mean. He was like pointing at you. Yeah, like as in you had screwed up or something. Um, which, by the way, there are no wrong answers in paper prototyping. So, so basically, the idea is to communicate the, the thought in a visual way to others. Okay. So just to explain what we do with our clients, and this is actually, there's a pretty well-established practice in the design community called a design studio that is very, very similar to this. If you've ever seen it, it's fantastic. What this does really well is it gets everybody to start to have a little bit of an understanding of, hey, maybe I could have some influence and start thinking through my idea in a more visual way. Right? That's really important. If you have a team of people and everyone is like, oh, 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 I've got this great idea for a feature. right? And if you're a technical person, then you're like, you know what I'm talking about. And you'll be like, oh, no. Right? What's fantastic is that you can get people to draw it out and nine times out of ten, they'll be like, actually, it's not such a great feature because when I drew it out, it looks terrible and I don't really understand it. Um, but it's a really nice way to get them to do it. If you're like, hey, you're so good at drawing. Why don't you draw that for me? Right? Now, on the other hand, if you're trying to lead a team, doing this exercise, literally four minutes, draw this story. Let's see how you view it. We do this all the time when we're prototyping in the Aachen group because we typically have very tight deadlines for huge projects. And what we do is I'll literally be like, you know, Eli is, one of, Eli is the co-founder of the Aachen group. I'll say, Eli, you know, let's just draw this real quick. We both draw and it's like, whoa, those are totally different visions for how this thing should look and feel, right? But it's great. Now we both know how each other's thinking. We can now kind of come to the best of both worlds of that. So again, what we do here is we'll typically, um, our clients love this, we'll, we'll take all their paper prototypes, we'll scan them in, and then we'll actually display them on the whiteboard and have you personally walk us through each one, right? And that's really when you begin to see, OK, the level of detail I was thinking of was way too deep or way too high. So I would rec highly recommend anytime you draw a paper prototype, it is built to show others. So I want to get a little bit more into kind of prototyping theory. I hate to use that word, but um, I guess practice. This really isn't theory because I, you know, it, it happens all the time. This is fidelity in prototyping. And again, you can have fidelity in prototyping physical objects, 
basically any kind of product, right, has fidelity. And what that means is how realistic is that prototype to the real thing, okay? In other words, how realistic is it? How much does it reflect what I'm thinking in this case? Because we're just talking about ideas, okay? And there are three different kinds of fidelity. You can think of it really simply as low, medium, and high, all right? Low fidelity is what you just drew, right? It's paper prototypes, okay? It looks like ugh, whatever, you know, it's got some text on it. You kind of get the idea, right? Medium fidelity has a little bit more to it, and then high fidelity can be almost close to mimicking the real thing. Depending on what you're building, if, if you're in the car industry, have, if you've ever been to an auto show, they will literally have cars that will never see the light of day that they have built, right? The whole car, it's a prototype because it is so expensive to actually invest and set up all the production for a real car that they want to be able to test the market to that level of fidelity. It's, it's totally insane, right? But it's a car company. So let's talk about the different levels. There's, there's visual fidelity, functional fidelity, and data fidelity, okay? So this shows them kind of beautifully, I think. Visual fidelity is the most obvious one, and I want to focus on that for a second because it's the most easy one to fall into a trap with, especially if you're prototyping things. Visual fidelity is how does it look, right? And it is absolutely the biggest trap in prototyping that I constantly fall into, and I know everyone who starts this does. Clearly, there's nothing, there's no visual fidelity to this. It is pencil and paper, just as low as you can get without it being non-existent, right? This is medium fidelity, okay? Some bolding around the text, some check boxes. It's obviously on a phone. That's a big piece of fidelity. It's got, you know, some of the iPhone style headers maybe, some menu bars that are more thought out. Okay, it's medium fidelity. There's no colors, there's no real graphics or anything. Obviously, this one is high fidelity. There's colors, there's graphics, there's some really interesting lists and icons about those lists and whatever. Here's the problem with visual fidelity. The whole point of doing this is to show your idea to other people in an easy and quick way, right? Low visual fidelity, they will be able to focus on the idea itself. High visual fidelity, they will not be able to focus on the idea itself. They will focus on the visuals. I don't care who you're talking about, that always, always happens, right? If, whether it's comments like, ooh, I hate that blue, right? It's like, well, that's really not that useful because it could be green or red or whatever. This is not the point at which we're deciding color schemes, right? Oh, I really hate the way this says April really small. Also don't care, right? But it's the visual. It's instantly what people can grab. And there's this um, great blog post about how visual fidelity creates nitpickers because you can just feel like you can really like, you know, jab at the other person if you're a jerk or like be really helpful by trying to tell them that the blue sucks. It's like not helpful. All right, so that's, that's visual fidelity. And I will say that we almost always, or sorry, we never take things to a high level of visual fidelity. Almost all of our applications that we do stop at the medium fidelity. Because by that point, you should have tested it and you should go into build if it's a good idea. Now, functional fidelity is does the thing actually work at all, right? Obviously with paper, no, it does not work at all. Medium fidelity, these check marks would work, right? This is a prototype that actually exists after, if you want to see it, I can show it to you on the phone, right? This plus sign would actually start to take you into the app. Here, there's a lot more functional fidelity. Like if I tap, for example, on you know, one of these big chunks, it'll actually open and the others will collapse, right? Because we need to do a lot more sort of fine grain testing. So again, low, medium, high functional fidelity. The last one is data fidelity. So data fidelity is actually something you want to deal with sooner rather than later, unlike visual fidelity. Data fidelity is this. Task one is low data fidelity, right? What does task one even mean? I don't know. But task one here has been translated into read chapter five in English, right? So already we're taking it up to a high level of data fidelity. And here you can see that that's obviously stayed the same, right? Read chapter five in English. The idea behind data fidelity is 
This is the text that's actually going to go into your application. And it's critical that you figure that out sooner rather than later. There's another great blog post I read a while ago about um, for those designers in the crowd or people who know about design. Designers love to use lorem ipsum. It's this kind of gibberish Latin style mix. They just stick it in everywhere. We're like, yeah, text will go there, right? And then they don't actually replace it. And no one talks about it because it's like, ah, it's just a placeholder. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get, nope. Nobody gets to it, right? And then you have these crazy, like, oh my god, who has the content? I didn't even think of that. That's the thing you want to avoid, right? Content is critical to almost all applications. Think it through before you actually start into any of this medium fidelity stuff. Ask yourself, well, what would task one actually be? Because I can't tell you how many times we start it low, and we're like, wait, what would task one actually be? And they're like, whoa, wait, if task one is that, then this whole application is actually very different than I thought it was. It can be a really clarifying conversation to have. So anyway, that's the three levels of fidelity. And again, I recommend that everyone start at low. Start with paper and pencil, no matter what you're trying to do. Looks like the police are here. If any of you are getting arrested, please just quietly leave. That'd be fantastic. Um, uh, so my question was, are you, what, I am not clear uh, what you're suggesting here, because so the task is actually something that the user will generate, right? The, the words that what the first task is, the chapter five, whatever. That my user is going to generate. How can I, why would I, or sh why should I generate? That's a great question. So the task is, in this user story, the user is actually going to generate their task, right? Yeah. Perfect. So that's exactly right. But if you remember the user story, he opens his app first. This is the first screen he would see. So we wanted to put in real data for what he would see. So in this story, he's already been using the app. So this would have been covered in the background, right? OK, there you go. So he'd, he'd already be using the app. So we'd want to actually show, OK, Derek here has today going to read five chapters in English. He's going to read um, chapter 17 in history. He's going to prep for, right? And then the rest of the prototype actually shows how he enters that data, and in fact, where it shows up in this screen. The whole prototype goes to the to the screen again for the end of that story. That's a great question. Uh, so we're, let, let me just let me just uh, wrap up here, and then we'll uh, we've got plenty of time for questions. So I want to talk a little bit about validation. Going to touch on it very briefly, but that's a whole other talk in and of itself. And documentation, right? I find that especially first time people want to document a lot of stuff, and it's not all that useful. So the tips I'd like to just give to you guys is get to the right level of fidelity in your prototype for the project, OK? It's really, really important. You don't go too high. High fidelity makes you feel better about yourself. It doesn't actually get you a lot farther in your project. Put it in front of users. So you now have a prototype. You should show it to other users. Get their feedback on it, right? See how that feels. Who cares? It's a stupid app for booking travel. They've already invented it. You don't need to do this one. But just actually asking people can be really, really hard. And when you put it in front of people, make sure that they match your persona. Or if they don't match your persona, why not, right? That becomes a really interesting conversation. Again, we're not going to get into the details of this right now. It's just too much to talk about. Validate your problems, OK? I had a great. Uh, uh, UX guy was he and I were giving a talk and and he and someone asked us well how do you validate problems right and what if you never ask about a problem right what if you never ask hey is your problem that you don't have enough time to do this because blah blah he said listen to people talk ask them about themselves listen to people talk and write you know if you're asking sort of relevant questions see what comes up if your problem literally never comes up. It could be really an interesting data point. It may not be very top of mind for them, right? And in today's crowded app marketplace for this product, that may be a huge problem because people aren't searching for your app, right? I thought that was a great point. Ask developers to do an iteration with you. So if you have a developer, right, which is great and awesome, and I recommend them, they're lovely people. Um, right, Doug? <laughs> um, do have them do an iteration with you. Have them go through this process with you. Right? This can be very clarifying for them. And finally, document as much as you need to. Right? Some people require a lot of documentation. Some people don't. This would be writing it down as much as you need to. You guys have written it down more than enough. You have index cards. This is your little idea deck you can take around with you and show to everybody. That's enough for this project. So I want to wrap up, and then we'll, we'll get to questions. So, the shared vision and understanding is critical. And this process is the best process we've ever done to get us to that shared vision and understanding quickest, right? Again, it's not very detail oriented. That's not the point of this thing, right? And even when you start, we've done a lot of product redesigns where there's a lot of details already there. 
we still take them back and do this exercise because of the shared vision piece. It needs to be simple, it needs to be succinct, it needs to be clear. Hopefully you can see how going through each of these steps in this way, and also let me point out, in this speed, maybe not this fast for everything, right? This is a little bit of a contrived example, but it shouldn't take you more than a day. We never spend more than a day with this on any client because we want to get them through this whole process. So understanding, shared understanding, critical. It's hard to test things in the real world, right? It's very hard to put things out there and to ask people, well, what do you think, right? And oftentimes, if it's super high fidelity, they also, this, was, this came up in last class, um, they also may just be nice to you. That's also a problem, right? So you really need to put things out there that are not perfect. As a great developer told me recently, if you're not ashamed of your release, you've released too late. People need to learn with you to build that shared understanding. The whole reason we went through this together is we had a shared experience and people learned together, right? If you need to get your team on the same page, or bring a new team member up to speed, actually have them go through this with you. Maybe have them do it while you, and you know, the both of you do it together and see what they come up with. It's an incredibly useful way for them to also learn with you to build that shared understanding. And the final point I want to make, and hopefully you've seen this pretty clearly, is Narratives are invaluable in communication. This is not just with products, it's anything. If you can tell a simple story that people can relate to, people will listen, they will like you more, they'll think you're more attractive. I'm just kidding, I don't know about any of those other ones, but I do know that they will understand you better. So with that, thank you guys very much. Uh, that's my email if you'd like to email me, chat about any more of this. OccamGroup.com is uh, our, our site where we, where we store a lot of this stuff. And I believe this video will be posted along with the slides uh, soon. So thank you guys, and we'll do, um, we'll do 30 minutes of uh, questions if you want. All right. Hi, I have a question regarding functional fidelity. OK. So if you don't have an app, if you have a physical product, what would that mean? Functional fidelity for a non-digital product. Yeah, so you you met, you met, uh, you mentioned that it has to be like good. It's good to have a medium fidelity kind of a prototype. Uh huh. What would that be? So I'm not an expert in physical products, but I can tell you, IDEO does a fantastic job with this and have a lot. Of IDEO, um, they have a lot of stuff on physical prototyping, but they have this great uh, blog post that they put up a while ago about they had to design a surgical tool for um, basically nose surgery, things that'll go up your nose and like do something, I don't really know, surgical, uh, I assume. Anyway, the way that they prototype this is they literally brought a, f a highlighter together, a film canister, and like two other physical pieces, taped them together and started to practice with that. That for them was medium fidelity. It's very hard to get, uh, I'm sorry, that's low fidelity. They then did actual like, um, whatever it's called, fabrication, 3D printing, that kind of stuff. Again, I'm not an expert at all in that, but I, I just love that they go through those levels of fidelity for physical products. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you said that narratives are, are invaluable. Now, are these the narratives that we make up, and are you kind of, I guess, I would imply from that to like tell these made up narratives to other people as if they're actual user narratives? No, you, you don't tell them as though like it's a product okay. that actually exists yet. If it doesn't exist yet, right? That'd be lying. Right. And you don't yeah, want to do I'm that. Um, what you do want to do is tell if you're going to talk about your product to someone. What I recommend is don't just go off about all the features and all the things it's going to do. Tell them the story about how a user goes through your okay. product. How they could, okay. mm -hmm. gotcha. right. It really helps with people being like, oh, now I get it, right? Hey, Josh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, how do you know this all works? So it works. It's been working with our clients. It's been under development for a couple of years. Um, we've had a number of clients, a uh, number of startups, actually, which I think is probably the most apropos to you guys, use this to raise a couple million dollars each, um, which has been really, really helpful for them, obviously, in the whole startup thing. Um, and. It's a great question, though, in terms of longer term, right? How do you know that it works? Honestly, it's still so new that we're starting to collect data on that now, right? We've had six products that we've built actually come to development and go on to market. 
Um, so we're starting to look at that now. What's really interesting is that what this doesn't do, what this doesn't capture, is all the pivots and all the stuff that happens after you actually go into development. That's a whole nother conversation and bag of worms. So it's a great question. Um, I think if your outcome is to kind of raise money and or bring a team along for a new idea, we know this works because we've seen it work with Rafi, we've seen it work with this, these great guys in uh, DC called Cobrain, they just raised a couple million dollars. Um, and then from the large company perspective, their metrics are a little different than whether they can raise money. Their metrics are, does everyone in the room agree that this is what we should do? That's actually worth millions of dollars to large companies, believe it or not. This, is, this has supercharged their development processes. Yeah. Back there. So when you work with companies um, that are are producing products or want to produce products for sort of the same group of people, just different products. Do you recommend they keep a focus group that they can call on at any time or do you like them to switch out their focus groups? That's a great question. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of focus groups personally. Um, my vision of a focus group, and I think that's changed a lot in the last couple of years because of all the research that shows that they're just completely ineffective, is group of people chatting about some sort of experience that they just had. Um, so the answer is no, but sometimes it actually makes a lot of sense because it's very hard to recruit customers to actually go through this stuff. So if you've got them on tap and their focus group, no, they're not the best customers to get, but if that's all you got, then totally going to go with that. Hopefully that's a fair answer to what, uh, what you're asking. Yeah. I know that there's a longer answer to this. <coughs> But if you know, want to know more about evaluation, uh, what the prototype, what, what's, uh, I'm, if there's a prototype that we have created and we want to know how to evaluate that better. What, what so there's a lot of other great resources that I can point you to. I mean, I can tell you about our process for doing it. It's very much about getting another user in the room. You sit with them. There's a lot of stuff you have to take into account about how you're going to bias that user against or for your product and how you want to manage that, right? Um, I'll tell you one tip that you should always do no matter what, and everyone always forgets, thank them and or compensate them in some way. That's really important. And typically what we do at least, you know, I can give you an example of a client I worked with recently. We developed a writing application for 14 to, um, well, basically 8th to 12th graders. We sat a bunch of 8th to 12th graders down, literally just watched them use the prototype, right? Had them talk about it, had them at, like, ask them about, well, so what's your, what are your issues in writing, right? We wanted to see, does their issues actually match what we think they are? Do they care about the same things we think they care about? The answers were yes in all those. We had a lot of experts that helped on this product. And then finally, well, does this prototype actually meet your needs, right? And of course, the answer is never going to be perfect, and you're never going to be able to come out of these interviews saying, wow, I have a winner. I know it, right? You won't, OK? I'm not even remotely promising that. But what you will come out with is a really clear understanding of what works and what doesn't about your product. And I can tell you right now, you're saving an enormous amount of money and time versus when you're actually in development or building the thing, and all of a sudden you're bringing in users and they're like, I hate that. And you're just going to be like, well, too bad, because that's what's making it in the product, right? Here you can be like, oh, all right, no problem. Just change that around and done. Yeah. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, two questions, actually just following up on your last comments. One has to do with the use of the application, the app, as really as a sort of a single purpose, single function tool. But in the real world, most tools or most products are multi-purpose or multi-function. So how do you manage to say the, the, you know, the rich complexity of that? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Second one also is in the process of prototyping, what you actually put out there and, and um, observing the reactions may identify other intended use or uses other than initially intended. In fact, may actually identify a killer app, if you will, for that product totally outside the narrative that you mm -hmm. crafted. Yeah. So, so, so how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I, the, an the second one is like, well, that's awesome. If that happens to you, just make sure you write it down. Don't get like crazy distracted by it, but you know, document it somewhere. That's fantastic. You're, that's a good sign, I would say. The first question is, I, I think, um, I'm sort of forgetting the first question now. Oh, right, right, right. So multiple complexities. This especially becomes true when you're working on collaboration software or software that has multiple users interacting with each other around different data sets. 
Our answer is just take it one at a time. If it's a collaboration project that you're working on specifically, who are the different actors in that collaboration? And go through them one at a time. What's their story? What's the next person's story? What's the next? So you really try to break things down into its individual chunks rather than trying to focus on the whole thing at once. So I would do this process multiple times uh, for those different things. Yeah? Um, I, I'm wondering. I'm wondering, you mentioned you don't advise like doing a new product where there's nothing comparable that exists or doing something that's like so broad that the target market is everybody, but like what about a case like Steve Jobs where the product is the PC which doesn't exist yet and the target market is like everyone with a mom, like d right. is that so, limiting if you So Steve Jobs is a terrible example to use because it's super <laughs> unlikely that you're like Steve Jobs. That'd be the first <laughs> thing I would say, no offense, but I'm not like Steve Jobs. I learned that one the hard way. I really thought I was because you know, of course, I think I'm awesome. Um, but what I would say is there were PCs in existence. There were plenty of them. He came around at a time where there was a lot of different kind of tinkering going on, and a lot of those different pieces were sort of coming together. You know, we could get into a talk about what Steve Jobs did and sort of how he did it. My answer is I, I, I don't ever like to think about Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. They are awesome individuals, and they've done amazing things. But I find it very useless to compare myself to them because I just wind up feeling bad about it. Uh, but just so you know, also, that is obviously not a, always the case, right? If no one else is out there doing what you're doing or doing it the way you think it should be done, that can still be a great product to build. I'm not saying stop. What I'm saying is that's interesting. It's something you should note, right? I can tell you I had an idea that no one else was doing, and it totally failed because no one else could understand it either, right? Uh, I don't want to get into that. Those are old days. Yeah, what's up? What was the name of the book that you recommended at the beginning? Uh, yeah, Inspired by Marty Kagan, C-A-G-E-N, I believe. Two more questions. Yeah. If you're talking about um, something that could have already been developed in a different space, but isn't in the space that you're in, mm -hmm. um, or there are things that are like it, but not exactly like it, um, how would you prioritize what you should be looking at? So should you be looking at similar not, so you wouldn't have competition necessarily, mm -hmm. but there are things that are very similar to it in mm -hmm. other spaces. So how would you prioritize that? Um, not exactly sure I understand. What's the? So say for our example, for this, there's a mobile app out there that books hotels, but there's mm -hmm. no mobile app out there that books travel. Yeah. So are you then, but the thing that you're trying to do is book things faster and there's nothing out there that books hotels faster and there's mm -hmm. no app out there that books travel. So where would you start? Well, so I, I, I guess the first place I would start is to ask that question of, is there really nothing out there that helps you book travel faster or purports to book travel faster, right? I mean, lots of sites, I'm sure, will say they do. So that'd be an interesting place to start. The other one is I would look very deeply at that hotel search, right? And I think looking at sort of adjacent products Really, really, really helpful, right? Understanding how they did it, how they worked on these things, if this, especially if it's a similar problem space like hotels, I think that's great. I would absolutely prioritize those. Yeah, I get we have one more question. Hi, uh, I, I get it. It's difficult to test in the real world. Uh, I've read and heard recently that it's better to observe what people do versus what they say they would do. So focus groups, bad idea, because the focus is on what they say what they would do. Uh, what are some best practices about around observing what people would actually do on technology, on apps? Do, do you analyze click by click what they actually do when they're in there using it? or So it depends on the stage. Really, that's a usability study, is getting into the level of like click by click analysis. We're typically not at that level of fidelity with our projects. So we're more looking at the overall, like, OK, wow, this person would totally use this kind of thing. Here were the behavior sets we saw going on. We'd also recommend, there's a great book um, out there that's name is escaping me, that influenced me quite a bit, which is if you have a chance to take your problem statement, your personas, and all this stuff, and even your paper prototypes, but before you've really invested a lot in prototyping, go out and actually observe your demographic Literally go watch them do stuff, right? So I think one of a great, a great way to learn how people use mobile apps is to go stand in the app store 
uh, I mean the Apple Store, and actually what, the App Store doesn't, you know, um, and, and watch what they do, right? You know, watch how they actually use their apps. Lots and lots of people are using apps out there. I mean, you have to get a little bit creative about where you go and find that kind of stuff, but doing a little bit of ethno ethnography or sort of observation never hurt anybody. Leads to a lot of insight. All right. So again, thank you guys very much, and feel free to come chat. <laughs>